Hi there. As far back as Newton and Huygens, scientists have been debating about whether light was a particle or a wave. Now, scientists knew about waves from their work on water and sound, and they knew from this work that waves can do something that classical particles can't do, and that's that two different waves can be in the same place at the same time. So, one of the verification of light as a wave was done by Thomas Young in his double slit experiment, where he shined light through two closely spaced narrow slits and showed a classic interference pattern that had also been demonstrated with water waves. Combining that with Maxwell's work in 1865, where he showed that light was an electromagnetic wave that traveled with C, speed C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, everyone concluded that light was a wave and all was right with the world until a little fly in the ointment came in the form of the photoelectric effect. Now, first let's define the photoelectric effect. What is it? The photoelectric effect occurs when you have light, usually, usually higher energy light, like ultraviolet light, UV light, or blue light. When light shines on some metallic surfaces, electrons are actually emitted from those surfaces. Now, early experiments with the photoelectric effect showed that when you shine light on a metal surface, the metal surface can become charged. Or alternatively, if you charge a uh, metal surface so that it has a um, negative charge and you shine a light on it, then the surface will actually go to neutral. So this has been shown. Now we call these emitted electrons photoelectrons. It was first demonstrated in 1887 by Heinrich Hertz. This is the same man who verified Maxwell's theories on the wave nature of light. And he observed the photoelectric effect and published on it in that year. In his experiments on the production of radio waves using a spark gap generator, he noticed that the sparks created in his experiment were larger when ultraviolet light was used than when visible light was used. Now, in Hertz's experiments, you created a spark over here at O, okay, and that caused a spark at R here at the receiver. Now, Hertz placed his receiver in a dark box to see the spark better, because sometimes the sparks were kind of weak. But when he did this, he noticed that there were smaller sparks that happened. And this was because, he later found out, the box had a window on it to let the uh, electromagnetic radiation generated by the spark at O in, okay? Now, this window that he placed on this box actually filtered ultraviolet light. When he changed the type of window to basic glass, and that transmitted ultraviolet light, the sparks at R got large again, okay? And he published on this effect. Now, this led to a flurry of interest and sort of the photoelectric effect became a hot topic in the late 1800s and early 1900s. This guy, Alexander Stolotov, he's a Russian physicist, he published extensively on the photoelectric effect, about six papers between 1888 and 1891. Now, in those experiments, he developed a better apparatus for actually measuring the photoelectric effect, one that could measure the current from the electrons that were emitted. He found that the current resulting from the exposure of the metal to ultraviolet light was proportional to the intensity of the light. Other experiments by J.J. Thompson found that the ejected particles, he called them corpuscles, in the photoelectric effect were the same as in cathode rays. We now call these corpuscles electrons. He used Crookes tubes in his experiment, and there's a picture of a Crookes tube over here on the slide. And in that, he used a metal plate in a vacuum um, and exposed it to ultraviolet light and measured the current coming off of that. Now this guy, Philip Lennard, he did more work on the photoelectric effect, and his apparatus and work most closely resembles the more modern apparatus that we use in our labs here at Appalachian State. Now, Leonard observed that the energy of the photoelectrons was actually proportional to the frequency of the light that shined on the metal surface and not the intensity. Notice here that I'm saying the energy of the photoelectrons, not the current. Remember, a current is a number of charges per unit time, and it doesn't say anything about what the energy of those charges are, just that they're moving through, okay? If you measure the kinetic energy of the electrons, that's a different measurement than the current itself. Now, on a side note, Philip Lennard, he was a Nazi. He was an early supporter of Adolf Hitler in the 1920s, and he wrote a four-volume physics textbook entitled Deutsche Physik that started a movement in Nazi Germany to get rid of all those Jewish physicists from the universities and purge them. It was later overcome um, 
by a law that forbid jews to hold positions in universities altogether but he actually dubbed einstein's work on general relativity and special relativity jewish physics einstein's going to have the last laugh here now let me describe a little bit about um, the apparatus that we have here and also lenard's apparatus this is kind of a little schematic of it here basically you have a collector and an emitter and you apply a voltage between um, the collector and the emitter. You have a variable power supply so that you can change the voltage applied between these two metal plates. You also have a voltmeter and an ammeter hooked up so you can read the voltage between the plates and the current um, from the photoelectrons. Now, when the plate is illuminated by light, you have a little hole here so that light from outside can pass through. Um, when that plate is illuminated by the light, and it has an appropriate wavelength or frequency, you can actually read a current off your ammeter. And this current arises from photoelectrons that are emitted from that negative plate and then collected at the positive plate. And this is oftentimes an evacuated tube. Now, at large values of an applied voltage in between the collector and emitter, the current actually reaches a maximum value. Remember, we said it was a variable um, power supply, so you can change what the voltage applied between the collector and the emitter are. So you notice that if you take it to a high voltage, then your current kind of maxes out. And that maximum current is going to increase as the intensity of the incident light increases. Now, if you take your voltage and bias it the other way, when delta V is negative, the current is going to drop off. And when delta V is equal to or more negative than a voltage called the stopping voltage, then the current goes to zero and you don't get any more photoelectrons emitted or detected. Now, in Lenard's work and in more modern apparatus used to measure the photoelectric effect, you can see that the dependence, there's a dependence of photoelectron kinetic energy on light intensity. Now this defies classical predictions of what should happen in the photoelectric effect. According to the classical predictions, electrons should absorb energy continually from electromagnetic waves. And then as the light intensity incident on the metal is increased, the electrons should be ejected with more kinetic energy. And this is because classical waves, like sound waves and water waves, their energy is proportional to the square of their amplitude. If you think about it, the louder a sound is, the larger the amplitude of that sound. And of course, we all know that the bigger a tsunami is, the taller it is, the more energy or a wallop it'll pack when it crashes onto the shore. So this makes sense from a classical standpoint. However, remember that in the photoelectric effect, the maximum kinetic energy of those photoelectrons wasn't dependent upon the light intensity. It was independent of light intensity. Okay, this is one of the things that Lenard showed. And instead, it's proportional to the stopping potential and the frequency of the light. Now, also according to classical predictions, one would expect that at low light intensities, there should be a measurable time interval between the instant the light is turned on and the time that an electron is ejected from the metal. In other words, a wave transmits energy over a, a long period of time. And the longer that you have the wave hitting the surface, the more energy is transmitted. Now, this time interval is required for the electron to absorb that incident radiation before it acquires enough energy to escape from the metal. So this would indicate that light could give the energy to the electron until it finally gets enough to be ejected. But that would take time. However, experimentally, we see in the photoelectric effect that electrons are emitted almost instantaneously, even at very low light intensities, as long as the frequency of the light is large enough. Now, the photoelectric feature number three that defies classical prediction was that in classical physics, the energy is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the wave, and it's not proportional to the frequency of the wave. For example, in sound waves, the pitch of the sound, how high or low the note sounds, is dependent upon the frequency, sure, but that doesn't have anything to do with the loudness of the sound, okay? That's proportional to the amplitude squared of the wave. But what we see in the photoelectric effect is that no electrons are emitted if the incident light falls below some cutoff frequency, F sub C here. 
and the cutoff frequency is characteristic of the material being illuminated. So the cutoff frequency isn't always the same. It'll be a different value if you have, for example, silver versus zinc. Also, no electrons are ejected if the light drops below the cutoff frequency, and this is regardless of the intensity of the light. So I can take red light, for example, and shine it as hard as I want, as high intensity as I want, on a metal surface and photoelectrons won't be ejected. But if I take blue light and shine it on that same surface, photoelectrons will be ejected even at very low intensities. Also, Lennard's work, measuring the dependence of the photoelectron kinetic energy on the light frequency, defied classical predictions. According to classical physics, there should be no relationship between the frequency of the light and the electrical kinetic energy, electrons kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy should be related to the intensity of the light instead. But the experimental results defied that prediction and showed that the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons increases with increasing light frequency. So, this was a real conundrum. This was a problem that couldn't be explained by existing physics. And here enter Einstein with a slide that I have entitled, Take That, Deutsche Physik. In 1905, Einstein published his paper on the photoelectric effect, and for this work, he won the Nobel Prize in 1921. The large leap that Einstein made in his explanation, the new physics that came out of this work was this. He described the light as a particle with an energy of h times f, where h is Planck's constant and f is the frequency. When this particle, according to Einstein, which we now know is a photon, strikes the metal. The collision kind of acts like the collision between billiard balls. The collision will produce a photoelectron. It will free an electron if that photon has a sufficient energy, greater than or equal to HF sub C, where F sub C is the cutoff frequency for that particular metal. Now this is really worth reiterating. Under certain circumstances, when light is interacting with the material, we can treat light as a particle and not a wave. The energy of this particle will be equal to hf, and then using the equation c is equal to lambda f, if we have the wavelength, we can write the energy of the photon as hc over lambda, where c is the speed of light, h is Planck's constant, lambda is the wavelength of light, and f is the frequency. So, when do you use the wave model and when do you use the particle model? You use them whenever it's convenient to do so. So for example, if you're trying to de de describe diffractive effects of light, it makes more sense to use the wave model of light. But if you're trying to describe how light interacts with the material in terms of the photoelectric effect, the particle model makes more sense. This is the beginning of what is known as wave-particle duality. So light can behave as either a particle or a wave depending upon the circumstances. Now, we'll later see that this wave-particle duality isn't present just for light, it actually applies to everything. Okay, here's Einstein's equation, his famous equation describing the photoelectric effect, published in 1905 and awarded for the Nobel Prize in 1921. It's that this. K max is the maximum kinetic energy of a photoelectron from a photoelectric effect experiment. K max is equal to HF minus phi, where HF is the energy of the photon, as previously described, and phi is what's known as the work function of the material. Okay? The work function represents the minimum energy with which an electron is bound in the metal. Okay? So, some metals hold on to their electrons more tightly than others and takes more energy to free those electrons. And this explains why the cutoff frequency um, for the photoelectric effect differs when you change from something like zinc to something like silver. Here's some, photo, um, here's some work functions for various metals. Sodium has a work function of about 2.46 eV. Zinc has one 4.31. And lead has one of 4.14 eV. Okay, so you can get these, you can find them in a table in your textbook. So here's the photon met model explanation of the photoelectric effect. It's as follows. There's a dependence of photoelectron kinetic energy on the light intensity. K-max is, there is no dependence of photoelectron kinetic energy on light intensity. K-max is actually independent of light intensity. 
Without enough energy, an electron can't be ejected, regardless of how intense the light is. Remember, I said, if you take red light and shine it on a metal, you're not going to have enough energy to eject a photoelectron. But you will, probably, depending on the metal, with blue or perhaps ultraviolet light. The time interval between the incident of light and the ejection of a photoelectron can now be explained with this new model as well. And that's because, regardless of how low your intensity is, each, photo um, each photon has an energy of HF. Okay? And so each photon can have enough energy to eject an electron immediately. You can think of it more like you think of a billiard ball collision from classical physics than you think of as uh, a wave rolling into shore, for example. Now you can also explain the current relationship. The current increases as the intensity of light increases. This was one of the first um, results published on the photoelectric effect, and you might find that a little puzzling. But the current increases as the intensity of light increases because you're actually, when you increase the intensity of light, increasing the number of photons. So the intensity of light doesn't change the energy of an individual photon. That's given by the frequency of the light. But the intensity of light is proportional to the number of photons striking that metal surface per second. So of course, as you increase the number of photons striking the metal surface per second, you're going to increase the current, right? Because if you assume that a certain fixed percentage of each photon creates a photoelectron, as you dial up the number of photons, you're going to get more photoelectrons, which means more current. Now in this plot up here, we see the relationship of the photoelectric current with light intensity, and it's a linear relationship, assuming that you hold the frequency of the light constant. So there's also a dependence of photoelectron kinetic energy on light frequency, and that's best described by Einstein's equation, K max is equal to HF minus phi. As the frequency increases, once it exceeds the work function, of course, the kinetic energy will also increase. All right? And there's a relationship, a linear relationship, between the kinetic energy and the frequency. And that's shown here in this plot. Okay? Now note that for different metals, okay, you have a different intercept down here. And that's because of the different work function of the material. If you're plotting K max, the photoelectron, um, uh, energy, kinetic energy, versus frequency. Remember, K max is equal to HF minus phi. And so they'll all have the same slope, but because phi will be different for different metals, they have different intercepts. Okay? And you can actually solve for what the um, work function is b uh, by figuring out what the cutoff frequency is. Here, the cutoff frequency F sub C is equal to phi, the work function, divided by Planck's constant H. And of course, you can rewrite that if you want in terms of the wavelength as well. Now, one of uh, the earliest experiments and our current experiment, Lennard's experiment and current experiments, modern experiments of the photoelectric effect, often measure what's called a stopping voltage. And this is if you apply that voltage in between your collector and your emitter, remember it's a variable voltage supply. So you can turn it up so that you have a large positive voltage or you can turn it and reverse it so that you have a negative bias. All right? If you apply this reverse bias and dial your voltage to a negative value, you're going to repel the electrons. So you'll have electrons actually emitted from the emitter and traveling towards your um, co uh, collector. However, if you have negatively biased it, there'll be a negative charge on that plate that will repel the incoming negative electrons. And if you make that voltage large enough, the negative charge on the plate will be large enough that photoelectrons can no longer reach the collector. And that will get your photoelectric current to go to zero. And this gives you the stopping voltage. And that tells you the max kinetic energy of the photoelectrons. You can get the max kinetic energy of the photoelectrons by assuming that the energy is all conserved. Okay? So in this case, your kinetic energy of your photoelectrons is all converted into potential energy as it fights up that field. And you might remember your equation from um, your introductory uh, physics course, K max is equal to Q, the charge, times delta V. Okay? So if it goes to zero, just at the zero point, okay, then you have all of the kinetic energy of your photoelectrons being converted into electrical potential energy, where the charge on the electron would then be Q is equal to E, 
and then you would multiply that times the stopping voltage that would come off your meter. From that, you can get your kinetic energy of your electrons. Let me do an example problem, because maybe an example problem is worth a thousand words. In this example problem, we have a silver ball, and it's suspended by a non-conducting string in a vacuum chamber. And you shine ultraviolet light on it, which has a wavelength of 200 nanometers. Now, what electrical potential will the ball acquire as a result? In other words, what voltage is going to build up on that silver ball? The work function of silver, by the way, you can read it off the charts, is about 4.7 electron volts. So here's my solution. First of all, we're going to find the energy of those UV photons using the equation E is equal to HF or HC over lambda. If I plug in for Planck's constant, um, Planck's constant in terms of EV seconds and units of EV seconds is 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15 EV seconds. And then I multiply that times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and divide it by the wavelength of my UV photon, 200 nanometers, or 200 times 10 to the minus 9 meters, I get an energy for my photon of 6.2 EV. Now, we can then use Einstein's equation, K max, um, set that equal to the charge Q here equal to E times delta V S, where the stopping voltage is there. Now that K max is going to equal to HF minus phi. Plugging in for HF, I get 6.2 EV, and then from the charts we read off that the um, work function of silver was 4.7 EV. Subtracting those two numbers, I get 1.5 EV for the max kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, but then I can also convert that into the stopping voltage okay, that the silver ball would reach. So here, since an electron volt is the energy that an electron has when passing through a potential of one volt, a 1.5 EV um, maximum kinetic energy means that the stopping voltage would be 1.5 volts. And that would be the potential acquired by that silver ball. So the explanation for this is as follows. The photoelectrons will travel through that vacuum chamber, and then they'll eventually land on the walls of the chamber. Now, this silver ball inside of a metal vacuum chamber acts like a big capacitor. And the capacitor will charge until the stopping potential is reached. So if you have a um, plus 1.5 volt um, bias on the silver ball, you'll have a minus 1.5 volt on the walls of the chamber. And that's the answer. All right. I hope that you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, you can always pause me, rewind, watch the video again, or ask me about it, and I'll see you in class.